The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Well, good morning. And welcome to Southside Bible Church. And we pray this morning that, uh, that as we open the Word of God, you would see Christ exalted. What a, what a song we just sang. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. How true that is. And this morning, I'm, I'm so excited to be able to share what God has put on my heart with you this morning. It is a, it is a joy as, as we're going to be partaking a communion uh, after the service uh, together. It's, it's um, going to be a little bit shorter, hopefully, uh, of a message, but um, I'll try to move quickly. Uh, but I, I pray that you will find today satisfaction in God and God alone. And all that we've been studying as we've been going through uh, the epistles of Peter and Second Peter, as Ken ended last week, you know, verse, verse 14, Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. To be found in him. This morning, if you turn in your... Bibles with me to Philippians chapter 3. We'll be looking at, at three verses here that, that set the stage for what I believe the Lord has been putting on my heart for the last few months. But we'll be moving through quite a few other texts uh, because I want you to see that, that what we're looking at this morning is everywhere in the Bible. And I want to begin, though, this morning by asking you a question. It's a very simple question on the surface, but, but one that maybe we should sit and think about for just a just a moment. If someone were to pull you aside and ask you to describe in one word what the gospel is all about, what would you say? Think about that for a minute. What, what would your response be? Could you boil it down in one word? And if you could, what would that one word be? There would have been a time in in my past, that my response would have been one of the following. Grace, mercy, love, forgiveness, justification. I mean, what, what defines God's, God's um, uh, view of salvation better than those words? But I would venture to say, and I, I pray that you will uh, see when we are finished today, that though these words are precious, they are not the gospel. I pray you will see that Paul would define the gospel with a different word. And I believe as we've been going through Peter uh, the, and journeying through his epistles, we would say that Peter has a different word. What I pray we will see, and God would drive to the depths of our hearts this morning as, as we dig into this text, is that God is the gospel. And you may be asking, what, what's the point of this distinction? But I pray before we are done, you will see this morning that it is everything. It is everything. Because to define the gospel as anything other than God is to define it by something that we get from God. But is not the point of the gospel. And I pray right now that if you feel that this is a trivial distinction, that before we're finished today, you're going to see hopefully that it is a foundational element. And I think I'm so passionate about this this morning because to define the gospel and what we get from it, from any way other than God, we're worshiping His benefits rather than God Himself. Until Christ's resurrection from the dead and the gospel promises of justification and eternal life lead you to behold and embrace God Himself as your highest joy, then you have not embraced the God of the gospel. You've embraced some of His gifts. You've rejoiced over some of His rewards. You've marveled at, at some of His miracles, but you have not been awakened to why those gifts and the rewards and the miracles have come. John Piper would say, they have come for one great reason, that you might behold forever the glory of God in Christ. And by beholding Him, be kind, become the kind of person who delights in God above all things. And by delighting, display His supreme beauty and worth with ever-increasing brightness and bliss forever. That, friends, is the point of the gospel. That God would become supreme in your hearts. That all God is, would, would, and it, He would be rejoiced in. 
and all that we have in Him. And as we will see in our text this morning, it's the only foundation that will sustain us through all of life's trials and set us on that immovable foundation. So I want to look at two points this morning as as I think it will be fleshed out here in Philippians 3. We're going to look at Philippians 1. We're going to look at many other texts this morning. But number one, God is the gospel. Number two, dying is gain. As I've already stated, I believe the ultimate goal of the gospel is God. It is Christ. The death of Christ, mercy, grace, justification, they're all just part of the gospel. But they all do one thing. They take away the the enmity that is between me and God so that I can have what? I can have Christ. So I want you to look with me at this very very familiar passage here in Philippians 3 for a minute. I want you to see the heart of Paul. I want want you to see what really made him tick. So Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. He says, Indeed, I count everything as loss, because of the surpassing worth of, hold on, what? The, the, the worth of avoiding hell? Well, that's a, that's a good thing. The surpassing value of what? Going to heaven? Well, that's a good thing. To have my life cleaned up, to not blow my life on sex and drugs? No, none of those things. As good as they are, No in view of what he says, of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. See, there's the point of the gospel. That we would know Christ Jesus our Lord. And just in case you didn't hear Paul the first time, he goes on, for, this, for his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may, what? That I may gain Christ. Verse 9, and to be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ and the righteousness of God that depends on faith. And then verse 10 again, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and may share His sufferings and become like Him in His death. Did you see that? For Paul, he considered all things as loss in view of the surpassing value, the surpassing value of knowing Christ and did you look back at the context of these verses and we see what, what Paul is considering rubbish in light of these things? Let's look back for a minute and, and see what, what Paul's talking about. Is it lust he's considering rubbish? Is it greed, envy, jealousy, anger, lying that he considers rubbish? Though these indeed are rubbish, Paul, Paul is something completely different. Paul is fighting those who had put confidence in the flesh. And if anyone's going to do that, Paul says, hey, I I got that covered. You think you have it? Let me just show you where I'm at. And look at this list starting in verse 5. These are all good things that he lists here. Family heritage, circumcised the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. By the way, where Saul, the first king of Israel, came from. Social status. Paul says he's a Hebrew of Hebrews. Paul says when it it comes to Hebrew living, yeah, I'm the upperclassman. The Hebrew of Hebrews. Uh, Biblical knowledge. Paul says that he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. The the Pharisees of the day, they were those known to have studied the Word and to to, uh, study it exhaustively and to know it. And as a Pharisee, Paul says, top of that class as well. Pharisee of Pharisees. And then Paul backs that knowledge up with with doing something about it. He says, as to zeal, he was a persecutor of the church. And if that wasn't enough, he piles on his moral lifestyle. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. Any of us able to say even just in the flesh what Paul is saying of himself here? You look at the resume Paul just laid out and you can see every one of them. It, it's a good thing. Family heritage, social status, biblical knowledge, zeal, moral lifestyle, all good and desirable things. But what Paul is saying here is that you can have every single one of these and not have Christ. Because Paul did it. Paul did it. Every one of these things are good in the flesh, but they do nothing for us in regards to heaven. But I'm afraid far too many in the church would stop right there and say, case closed in regards to their salvation. 
They would look at those things and bank on their salvation because of them. Paul says, no. No. I, I count them all rubbish in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ. See, Christ was everything to Paul. Just so you, so you don't think that this is just Paul, let's look at, uh, let's look at uh, Moses here for just a minute. Actually, hold on. We're going to go back to Moses in just a minute. Let's go to Philippians 1 first. Philippians chapter 1. And here we know Paul was in prison. He's taking a, a double whammy because those who are outside are preaching Christ out of selfish ambition only to, to afflict Paul. And you, Paul just keeps getting kicked while he is down. And what does he say? Let's look at what he says in verse 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that I will rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. And it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be put at all ashamed. But that with full courage, courage now as always, Christ will be honored in my body whether by life or death. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. See, Christ is everything to Paul. God is what Paul gets out of the gospel. And it's only when God is the gospel and when Christ is all you have that you can truly say dying is gain. Because you get more of the only thing that is gain to you. I was listening to a, a sermon uh, this past week, and, and it asked the question that I had to meditate on all week, and that question was this. Take all the good things of life that Paul's been talking about, your, your family heritage, your social status, your biblical knowledge, zeal, moral lifestyle, basically all the good things that we have in this life, and even add to it a list of all the possessions that we have, the money we make, the businesses we own, the houses we live in, the cars we drive, the health we have, pile them all up and put them on a column, would you be able to label the top of that column loss in view of Christ? And then put it in another column, Christ, and at the top of that column, label it gain. Gain. And I want you to be able to ask yourself with dead serious honesty in your heart today, is that true of my relationship with Christ? If all the things on that column were to be taken away from you and you stood there in the midst of the ashes of all of them as Job was, would you be able to say, gain? Gain. Because I have Christ. And I want you to think about that and I want you to, to meditate on that, not only now, but even as you go home today and answer, do I love and cherish Christ like that. And just so you're tempted, as I said before, that Paul's the only one. Let's look at Hebrews now. Let's look at Moses. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Did, did you get that? Moses chose mistreatment with the people of God over and above all the fleeting pleasures of sin. And oh, for a, a son of Pharaoh's daughter, daughter can, you, can you imagine what that would have been? The world, world would call that off-the-charts pleasures of sin. Any drug, any woman, any amount of money, it, it was his for the taking. But what does it say Moses considered, verse 26, the reproach of Christ, greater wealth than the treasures of of Egypt. How incomprehensible is that apart from if you know Jesus Christ? Moses wanted more than anything Egypt had to offer. He wanted Christ. And that's the point of the gospel is that we get God. As we've been going through Peter's epistles, 1 Peter 3.18, For God also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. Why? Why did He do that? Why did the God of eternity come and, and, uh, and give His life for us? 
to give us our best life now? Is that what the scripture tells us? No. He says, no, that he might bring us to God. That's the point of the gospel. The Christ would take away every sin that separated us from him so that he would bring us to God. And yet we jam everything else into the gospel until Christ just becomes a boring afterthought. We have somehow interpreted the gospel to mean that we share Christ when it's easy and convenient, but, but whoa, whoa, wait, wait just a minute if it's going to cost me something. Wait just a minute if it means that I'm, we're going to send a family with 11 kids halfway around the world to a Muslim country. Wait just a minute if that means that I have to give up my livelihood and lose my life for the sake of the gospel somewhere else. Wait a minute if that means stepping out of my comfort zone and going to evangelize on a college campus. And all I have to ask is, what gospel is that? The whole point of the gospel is that Christ might bring us to God, to come to know God and to commune with God and to share with others so that they would come to know God. Let's move on to 2 Peter. 2 Peter 1, 2. May the grace and peace be multiplied to you what? How? How is grace and peace going to be multiplied to you? He says, in the knowledge of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. How's grace and peace going to be multiplied to Peter's readers? In the knowledge of God. Verse 3, His divine power has granted to us everything that pertains to life and godliness. How? Through the knowledge of Him who called us into His glory and excellence. Are you getting the picture yet? One more. 2 Corinthians 4 5 and 6, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let shine, light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give what? To give health and comfort and safety? Is that what the Word says? No. No, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. That's what the Gospel is about. That we would come to see and adore and worship the glory of God. And where do we see the glory of God set on display? In the face of Christ. In the face of Christ. And as you look and behold Him and commune with Christ and see the glory of God set on display, all the attributes of God that have been set on display as we see God highlight His grace and His mercy and His justice, it, the list goes on. And as, as we look and behold and worship God for these things, then God is glorified. Edwards would say, it is when God's attributes are rejoiced in that He is glorified. How can we not rejoice in a God who is so infinitely beautiful? So I was reading a quote from Edwards this week. My, my heart just soared. and I have to admit, I, I just cried like a baby over this. To think that the wretched sinner that I am and all the shortcomings and sins how often I even blow it now, even as a blood-bought child, I often fail and fall short. Yet Edwards points out this. The creation of the world seems to be specifically for this end, that the eternal Son of God may obtain a spouse, towards whom He may fully exercise the infinite benevolence of His nature, and to whom, as it were, to open and pour forth all that immense fountain of condescension, love, and grace that was in His heart. And in that way, God is glorified. How awesome is that? How incomprehensible is that kind of love of God for you? To me... A wretched, undeserving sinner? How could I possibly be the, the eternal bride of the eternal God? Unbelievable. How could I ever want anything more than Him? How could I ever want heaven if it were not Him that was going to be there? I am the bride of Christ upon whom God opened and poured forth all that immense fountain of condescension, love, and grace that was in His heart. That just, that just overwhelms me. I don't know about you. So please, even as we look at Edwards, he's just shown me so much and my heart just, just leaps when I read some of the things that he wrote on this subject. So 
One more quote from him. God himself is the great good which the redeemed are brought to the possession of and enjoyment of by redemption. He himself is the highest good, the sum of all good which Christ purchased. God is the inheritance of the saints. He is the portion of their souls. God is their wealth, their treasure, and their food, and their life, and their dwelling place, their ornament, diadem, everlasting honor and glory. God is the gospel, in other words. Amen. So again, I ask you, is Christ enough in that column? To say gain. To label it gain. And if that answer is not what flies out of your heart with a resounding yes, then, then I beg you, as Edwards would say, open up your Bible and lay yourself in the way of allurement. Go to the Word of God and view Christ. Fall in love with Him there. Because at the end of the day, Christ better be the pearl of great price that we are willing to sell all in order to have. And all the temporal blessings that come are completely secondary. They're never promised. For the sake of teaching Job um, who God was, God mentions Job to Satan and then allows the destruction of every single thing in his life. And at the end of the book, we see Job standing in awe of God and saying, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes see you. Now my eyes see you. And it was enough for Job. God never gave him one reason why he did any of the things he did to him, but it didn't matter to Job. God was enough. But to read that story and say, well, that was, that was rough for Job, and then somehow think the gospel that means something else for us. What is the ultimate goal of the gospel? God is. Christ is. I pray that our hearts this morning would stop finding satisfaction in all of the blessings that God gives. We would start finding our soul satisfaction in God Himself. In God Himself. Number two, dying is gain. Verse 21 of Philippians 1, For me to live is Christ. And in light of that, if living is truly Christ, for us then, he says, to die is gain. Verse 10 of Philippians 3, that I may know Him in the power of His resurrection, that I may share in His sufferings, become like Him in His death. See, the result of the Gospel, Paul tells us, is that because living means Christ above everything else, dying is gain, because then I get what? More of Christ. More of Christ. As I know Him and the power of His resurrection and share in His sufferings and become like Him in His death, more of Christ is all I want. You see, the hallmark of the Gospel Paul believed and gave his life to preach was, was Christ. And what can touch you when you have Christ? When you can say that Christ is in the gain column and every single thing else in life is on the loss side of that column, how can suffering not be a gift from God. Don't get me wrong, there, there's not one text in Scripture that, that tells us to, to uh, go and find suffering. But oh, there, there are so many that tell us that when trials come, we are to find our steadfastness then in Christ. Look back at Philippians 1. Paul is writing from prison. He's being slandered by those who want to cause him pain. And, and, verse, um, and what does he say? Verse 12 through 14. I want you to know, brethren, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has been become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, as are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Paul doesn't complain about his circumstances, though he's in the midst of prison and says later on he doesn't want to be there anymore. But why? Because the gospel is being preached throughout the whole Praetorian Guard. The whole Imperial Guard is hearing because of his imprisonment. And then the brothers are, are emboldened to go out and preach the gospel without fear. In a nutshell, God is being proclaimed. See, and that's what thrills the heart of Paul. Well, what can touch that? What can touch that? Look at Paul when, when he has a thorn in the flesh and, and he goes to God three times. In 2 Corinthians 12, he says, 
But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weakness, so that what? What? Why would you boast in your weakness? And why would you boast then in the thorn in the flesh that God is giving you? What are you talking about, Paul? He says, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. See, there's the gospel in a nutshell. All we want is the, for the power of Christ to rest on me. It's for the sake of Christ that we are not just endure, but Paul says here, he is content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. How is that? For when I am weak, then I am strong. Then I am strong. You see, that's the Christian life. If Christ is glorified in my weakness, then give me weakness. That's what Paul's saying. Anything to see Christ glorified so that His power would rest on us. Dear saints, that's my heart and my passion for you that you would see and savor Christ in that way. And then out of that, you would find infinite delight that grounds you in the grace of Christ. You don't know how many of you have been overwhelmingly encouragement to me as you've gone through every trial imaginable, I've watched God be faithful to you and give you the grace in the midst of that trial. I've watched cancer come and the fear that, that would have torn you apart before the trial now is swallowed up in the midst of God's grace as He strips away all the things that you thought were important to you and set Christ in that place. And I know there are those of you here who have lost children and faced cancer and lupus and strokes and health in a million ways falling apart and spouses that have decided to leave and businesses that have failed and jobs that, that go bad and, and lost and, and you know, the list could go on and on. We have seen it here, but in the midst of those trials, so many of you are finding sweet steadfastness in Christ that says for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Because truly when we can say, all I have is Christ and that is enough, it's then you realize it's suffering that has brought you to that point. Did you hear that? It's been said, suffering is a gift when treasuring Christ above everything is your goal. Did you hear that? Suffering is a gift when treasuring Christ above everything is your goal. And that is so true because in the times of suffering, when things are being taken away from you, you realize once again, Christ is all you have. And guess what? He is all you ever need. It's everything you need. And I can remember sitting with, with Rich Gowdy, who many of you know, passed away some years ago of leukemia. And I can remember sitting there in that hospital room with him, just fellowshipping with him over the Word. Fellowshipping over the beauties of Christ together. He's telling me with, with the greatest of excitement all he's been experiencing in God and how he's been overcome with peace in the midst of this, this trial. And how sweet the fellowship was that he was having with Christ as he lay there in that bed. He told me one day something that just blew my mind. Made my heart sore. He said these words, I don't know if I want this trial to end because I don't want the sweetness of the presence of God that I'm experiencing in my life right now to ever be forgotten. And that was happening because in those days when the prospect that his life could possibly be over and all the things that his life had been about before up to that point didn't matter anymore. And he was able to find deep communion with Christ in that moment. And it was, life, it was this life-changing trial that drove him to Christ. And what he found there was overwhelmingly beautiful to him. And Rich could say leukemia then was a gift that drove him to the treasure of Christ. And I just wanted to dance as, I, as I'm watching before me because there's nothing but the beauty and the grace of God that could do that in Rich's life. And as a shepherd, my heart was, was just overwhelmed because Rich is getting it. 
And I pray that your heart is saying, I want that. I want that no matter what circumstances I go through in life. I want the steadfast love of Christ to ground me and anchor me so that my heart is immovable in Him. And I pray that whether cancer comes or all of life in every other way falls apart around me, that my life would be found in Him. And all that we would be anchored in Christ in heaven. When Jonathan Edwards was being slandered and kicked out of the pastorate of his church and everything that would have meant security and a future for Edwards, not to mention the pain of pouring your heart out into these people and, and trying to show them the glory of God, yet so many of them seemed to hate you and wanted you gone. We have a testimony of one who watched Edwards in, the, in these meetings as he was being fired and he, he said this, that faithful witness received the shock but was not shaken. I never saw the least symptoms of displeasure in his countenance the whole week, but he appeared as a man of God whose happiness was out of the reach of his enemies and whose treasure was not only future, but a present good. And I echo what Jason Meyer said as he shared that quote with me. I want that. That's what I want. I want the steadfastness that only, not only takes the life and death things, but also the day-to-day -day trials of my life, and I find happiness to be out of the reach of all of my enemies, out of the reach of all of my circumstances. And I want that for you. I want you to be here on Sunday mornings to hear the Word of God preached so that as we clearly open up the Word of God, you see Christ and you exalt in Him. I want you to fellowship with the rest of the body because we are here pointing one another to that Christ. That's what the gospel is all about. It's God setting on display all of His attributes for us to see and to fellowship around and then Him receiving glory as we delight in them. Finding steadfastness of heart and soul from them. Look at your own sin and you see the, own, the heinousness of it. Let it make you fall in love with God even more who has covered it in grace. And then let it fuel you to, to greater obedience. Why? Because you never want to displease the Father who, is, who has given us Christ to take away those sins. Be the ones who, who live James 1, where James tells us, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter fair trials. Consider all joy? What do, you, what do you mean, how is that possible? James tells us, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. It produces patience and trusting God and, and waiting upon God and then looking to God is greater than all of those trials. That God is greater than cancer and God is greater than finances and well-being. That God is greater than family. God is greater than any suffering and He will be the steadfast, immovable rock and provided that He is the gospel to you. That only when He is the gospel to you. Only when God is the gospel to you will you realize that He is the happiness that provides true satisfaction for our souls. To spend eternity with Christ enjoying Him forever is better, far better than any accommodations we have here. God is greater than any pleasure. God is greater than any pain. And I know it's so easy to say that as a theological line or verse, but when it, when it hits home, you really find that that's where your joy rests. As a pastor whose heart saw these things and rejoiced in them perhaps more than, than any other, Edward's life displayed Christ was everything to him. From his daily steadfastness in his own circumstances to the comfort he would give others in time of suffering, Christ was everything to Edward's. He wrote a letter to Benjamin Coleman, a pastor in Boston, who in the matter of a few weeks had his daughter die, his wife become incapacitated, and, and his associate pastor died. All these things within a few weeks, and, and all these heart-wrenching, life-changing things happened to this man more than, than we would probably experience in a lifetime. And I sat and I thought, what would I say to a man when he has just lost all of this? What would I say? Some trite verse from the Word? I sat thinking about that. What would I say? What comfort would I give that would remind him of the steadfastness that we have in Christ? And 
Edwards would remind him that though you have lost some of the blessings of God, you have not lost God. He was saying that even though God has taken away some of the temporal lights of life, you have not lost the sun. That God is drying, or drying up maybe one of the streams of His blessings. You have not lost the ocean. You see, Edwards knew the secret of life that through this life, that though this life is filled with trials and they, they hurt, yes, we're going to experience pain. We're, we're never going to be uh, masochists that, that, that think we're just going to be stoic through all of tri- the life's trials. It's not what the Word of God tells us. Yes, we're going to hurt and it's going to bring deep pain. There is deep pain when, when, and there's many tears we will shed as we walk through this life, but He never took His eyes off the fact that God outshined every single one of those lights. God was infinitely more satisfying than the stream that He took away. His joy was out of reach of the circumstances of life because it wasn't set in the circumstances of life. And I want you to ask you again this morning, is God the center of the gospel that you have believed? Is joy in Him the center of what the gospel means to you? Is He the sole source of steadfastness through all of life's trials for you? And as we go to communion this morning, is that what the body and the blood of Christ means to you? Let's pray. Father, this morning my heart is just so full as we've looked and seen Christ. Our hearts are just overwhelmed with all the the love and the grace and the mercy that you've given us. But Father, those are the things that made it possible for us to have you. Father, you are worthy of all of our praise. Father, I pray that you would be glorified as we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you would strip away all of the the enjoyments that we have here in this life that are somehow keeping us from enjoying Christ supremely. Father, I pray that that if you are sending us around the world to share the gospel, that, that there would be no fear because we are seeing Christ glorified. That is what matters to us. Oh, Father, I pray for us in our American society and culture that that teaches us comfort and ease is, is what we get from the gospel when you tell us no, 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 we get you. And maybe we lose our lives because of you and your gospel, but that is okay because we have more of Christ. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Oh, Father, drive it deep within our hearts this morning. As we come to communion, I, I pray that we would rejoice in the, in the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, as we partake of this, may we remember that you have given us yourself. I thank you for all of your amazing grace this morning in your son's name. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.